Um, what do you expect to see at two o'clock this afternoon, mate? Uh, well, there's five seventy thousand specials coming in, um, and oh, I've been listening to commentaries, and I do wonder whether this time the specials don't go as they have done in the past, just because of the outcome of the main election. And so, apart from the overhangs from Port Waikato and possibly Maori, um, it may not mean a dip in uh, uh, percentages. But uh, the interesting area is really the electorate seats, isn't it? Just who who ends up winning those and those little marginal seats that you spoke about during the week. Um, so it will mean a coalition required and whether... I think the argument's moved on from two or three. I think it's just on uh, what type of uh, arrangements are in place for all three parties. But I'm not expecting that to be concluded because... Uh, Luxon has said he's not going overseas, which sort of indicates that he needs some time to bed things down. So it's not going to be 24 hours, but it might take it might take a week to bed down the arrangements. It's a fairly um, clear idea, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that whether or not New Zealand First is in, I think they're in, uh, yep. and and they've been working towards that for well at least a week now. Um, yep. Uh, just uh, there is a suggestion, Craig, that that will lead to, and obviously it was a suggestion about, pardon me, I earlier guessed in Gridleri that that will lead to a coalition of chaos. Are you so pessimistic? No, no, I'm not pessimistic at all uh, because of the similarities of some of the policies. So uh, I'm expecting repeals of legislation to be pretty clear around, for example, the area of law and order. I think that's quite clear. Um, there's opportunities in education. It's just a question of the depth of those reforms uh, that need to take place. Cost of living is an issue for all the parties, so I'm expecting, you know, some changes to the RBNZ mandate. Um, or that Winston may not be as convinced as the other two parties. And a clear change in the fiscal strategy to improve delivery of services. So, you, you know, the first step is repeal. So, can they on fairly quickly. And I'm looking forward to a list. Business leaders need a list of what you've all agreed on so we know the boundaries of your decision makings. Um, that'd be really helpful. So there's some things to start with, I think, Michael. No, it's been interesting you say what the business perspective is on this one, Craig, and you're right. What you're looking for is certainty over the next three years as to the direction you're going so you can then start to do your planning. You don't mind the direction, you just need to know where it's going. Well, I, I do mind the direction, but um, <laughs> a, a, a direction is better than none. The question in everyone's minds is, and you've spoken about this for a few weeks, is what is the reaction function of the coalition to unforeseen events, which aren't foreseen by a, a policy list, you know, a, a coalition list? So Wuhan Pu, you know, what is, what is the natural reaction of the Prime Minister to uh, Wuhan to What is the natural reaction of the coalition to uh, an escalation of tension with China? Those sort of things aren't in a coalition agreement, but how do, how do you know which way they'll move? Mm. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I guess that's right. Um, how are you going to manage emergency and yeah, critical yeah, events? Well, we, I, know, I think can reasonably anticipate in the next three years there'll be some form of natural disaster too, can't we? Yeah, well, yes, the probability is hard to judge, but they're, they're always around the corner, just how big and, and when um, and whereabouts in the country. But it sort of goes to that question around values. You know, if you knew really strongly to combine the three coalition leaders into a single person, what sort of values would that person have and how would they react to events? Because sometimes gut instinct has to kick in um, and you need to know what, where their natural inclinations are. So that's, that'll be uh, important to watch and understand and to tease out from these leaders once they've got the documents done. Mm. Um, now, so from the perspective also, um, you mentioned in uh, the text to me uh, this morning about what you wanted to talk about today, and you mentioned uh, this issue of the government being or receiving advice uh, that New Zealand will miss, miss its emissions target uh, 
to that we signed up for at Paris uh, by 2030 by 114 megatons of carbon. I take what what is I mean I, sorry just that word I'm I'm confused and you won't be but um, yeah what's 114 megatons? Yes, yeah, so a megaton is a million tons of carbon dioxide. So we have an agreement with the Paris target to reduce our emissions by 30% from um, uh, levels in 2015. So uh, 114 megaton emissions uh, is in perspective in our emissions reduction plan documented on the Ministry for the Environment's website, the 2022-2025 expectation of reduction in emissions was 11.5 tonnes. Now, if we've missed by 114 megatons, so same same number, 11.5 megatons, reduction by 2025, if we've missed expectationally by 114 megatons by 2030, that's 10 times. So it's kind of off the scale. And the commensurate discussion which I've had with you is in order to get back inside that Paris target, we have to buy European carbon credits, which are estimated by Treasury at between three and twenty-four billion New Zealand dollars. Um, you know that that scale is enormous. But what's frustrating for us as taxpayers, if this was made available by officials to the Labor government in September, why were we not told about it? What? Why can't we get better information about the implications for taxpayers? as we move through to 2030. I mean, it's it's almost criminal that we're not being told these numbers. Mm, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I don't see any mainstream media covering it to, with any great degree of alacrity either, Craig. Um, I'm thinking ahead, two options. Um, right throughout the Western world at the moment, um, I'm thinking particularly of the UK and Rishi Sunak, for example, the Prime Minister there, they are re-looking at their international climate change commitments um, as a consequence of the cost of living crisis. And I imagine that's a fairly common response throughout the Western world. Does that mean we start paying the money in 2030, Craig, or does it mean that long time before 2030, we start not renegotiating, but resetting what those targets are? Well, there's always trade-offs in my thinking, and the public, the taxpayers need to know the cost of the transition. So if you're spending at the upper limit, $24 billion New Zealand dollars, it means something else has to be foregone or your taxes go up or you have to borrow more. Or, or you just say we're not going to pay or you say to the... Prep, prep, well, well, that's right. Or, or, that's it. Yeah, or, in the last bit, you're quite right, you say, well, we're going to re reduce our our emission target or we're going to delay till 2035 mm. which is the way the UK government's been thinking yeah. because of the cost yeah. and it's an affordability issue and only 50% of New Zealanders who are working pay tax 50% don't pay tax because of working for families so the impost from the taxpayer falls in an income tax sense disproportionately on half of personal income taxpayers so you know, there are a whole lot of equity issues in here as well. But the, the frustrating thing is just not having the discussion on the cost of the transition. And we have aspirational ideas, but when we sit down as practical Kiwis and say, how are we going to pay for this? And then very quickly, why should we pay for that? We need this friction and this discussion in the open um, channels of discourse in this country.